Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I am so grateful for technology that allows us to gather for a special event like this, no matter where you are. Um, I am Rihanna Concheris. I'm the Program Director of Community Relations for the Center for Justice and Reconciliation at Point Loma Nazarene University. And it is my privilege to facilitate our Churches Against Trafficking Network, which partners with local churches to help educate and mobilize the faith community to support local anti-trafficking organizations and provide tools for churches to engage in the work to end human trafficking. We have an entire 13-step action guide for you to find where you and your small group or community and friends can get plugged into the anti-trafficking efforts in our region in a way that matches what you're interested in and passionate about. So check that out at our churchesagainsttrafficking.com. It's a great place to get started. And you can also stay connected with Churches Against Trafficking by following us on Facebook and subscribing to our monthly newsletters. We have tons of resources and invitations to webinars and events like our quarterly Churches Against Trafficking meetings. Those newsletters are a great way to stay up to date with what's happening in the anti-trafficking space. So head to churchesagainsttrafficking.com to sign up for the email list. And that brings me to today's event for our summer CAT quarterly meeting, we have the unique opportunity to show the stolen documentary, followed by an expert panel of folks featured in the film and working day in and day out in our community to combat trafficking in different ways. We are also so thankful for Monica Dean being here to share not only her hard work, but her incredible heart for ending human trafficking in our region and mobilizing the faith community to do so. Monica Dean is an Emmy award-winning anchor and reporter for NBC7 San Diego, where she has worked for the past 17 years. And you may recognize her as an anchor on NBC7's weekday newscasts at 4 and 5 p.m. Even today, she sprinted over here after delivering the news, and we are so thankful for that. Most recently, Monica led a year-long investigation for an NBC7 documentary series titled Stolen, focusing on the sex trafficking of children in San Diego. So I will hand it over to you, Monica, to tell us more about what we're gonna experience in this film. Rihanna, thank you so much. Gosh, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here. Of course, I wish I could see you in the audience tonight, but I am just so grateful that you have logged on and that you have tuned in to see this because I believe in the power of the truth that we have revealed through this investigation and the voices that you will hear tonight. I believe they have the power to change somebody's life or even save a life, so thank you for being here. The documentary that you are about to see is the product of a nearly two year long investigation. We researched, we investigated, we interviewed people. It features the courageous voices of survivors and lived experience experts who know the traumatic impact of sex trafficking and exploitation firsthand. And they are the true heroes of Stolen. I can't thank them enough. This was the most difficult assignment of my career. Truthfully, it was more than an assignment. It was a calling. It was a journey. Here we are at Journey Community Church. This was the biggest journey of my journalistic career. It's something that I felt compelled to do because what we're talking about here tonight, sex trafficking and exploitation, is clouded in conspiracy theories and myths truths. So we wanted to get to the heart of what this issue was all about. And I applaud you for being here because the truth is, we all have a role to play when it comes to combating sex trafficking and exploitation. And understanding where you fit into that solution really comes and begins with awareness. Sometimes it could be just as simple as a conversation with a friend, with a child, with a neighbor, with a coworker. And so I wanna challenge you, I wanna ask you tonight as you watch this documentary, think about your sphere of influence. Think about how you might be able to affect some positive change in this space. 
Stolen was initially created as a seven episode docuseries. So what we did is we took different themes pertaining to this issue and we created episodically different episodes that featured information and voices pertaining to that theme. And a lot of the information in those seven episodes pertains specifically to San Diego. So if you'd like to learn more about that, all of those episodes are available to you and for you to share at NBC7.com slash stolen. The series has definitely resonated with audiences around the globe, and I am humbly grateful for that. Recently, we found out, in fact, just uh, last week, that Stolen has been honored with a National Edward R. Murrow Award in the category of excellence in, in innovation. And <laughs> thank you. Thank you to my small studio audience here. Thank you for your applause at home. This, this was huge. Uh, this was actually the first National Murrow Award that our station, NBC7, has ever received in its history here in San Diego. Uh, the series has also been honored with regional uh, Murrow Awards, Telly Awards, a Golden Mic, several Emmy Awards, but really it's not about the trophies. It's not at all about the trophies. It's about shedding light on a dark topic and knowing that these awards are going to increase exposure and awareness that could lead to changed lives. And for the survivors who courageously trusted us to tell those stories, I can tell you without a doubt, your voices are being heard. What you're gonna see tonight is the feature length version of this documentary. So we took those seven episodes and we compressed them down into about an hour and 15 minutes, which is what you're going to see tonight. And if you wanna learn more, I would encourage you to watch the seven episodes on NBC7.com slash stolen. The version you will see tonight is also available for free on NBC's Peacock app. Just download the app on whatever streaming platform you have and search stolen. You will likely have some questions as you watch tonight. We hope that many questions will be answered, but as you watch tonight, there will be questions, and we want you to submit those questions so that we can address our panel in our panel discussion after the documentary and get those questions answered. The link is up on your screen right now, so just go to that link, you can submit your question, and we will do our best in the short amount of time that we have to answer as many questions as possible. We have fantastic panelists here, a few of them you will recognize from the Stolen documentary, but all of them understand this topic personally and intimately. It is truthfully my prayer that after watching this entire event tonight, after hearing our question and answer discussion, that you're gonna come away with a new understanding, that you will have a new appreciation for this problem and how it perpetuates in our communities and how people's lives are affected by this, and that many of you will be inspired to action by what you see here tonight to help others take back what's been stolen. We are back here at Journey Community Church, and I'm joined by some amazing people. I always cry at the end. I have watched those clips so many times, ladies, that I could recite them by heart, but those people are so much more than just people on a screen. They are somebody's mother, daughter, sister, brother, and I hope that you experienced their stories intimately there as you sat and watched. Thank you for watching the entire documentary. I do want to mention that we have a host of resources available to you on NBC7.com slash stolen, where we have interactive content, of course, the seven episode series, a podcast, uh, as well as 15 different articles that go in depth about more of this information, of course, Tremendous resource through Point Loma Nazarene Center for Justice and Reconciliation. They do a tremendous job reaching our church community and beyond with resources to equip you at home and in your communities to reach out about human trafficking and help uh, fight this, this terrible injustice. Before we get to the question and answer, and you have some wonderful questions, thank you for chiming in. I hope that you have all logged your questions. You can continue to do so uh, at the link that we provided. I want to have each of our panelists introduce themselves. Keelan, we'll start with you. Thank you so much. 
My name is Keelan Washington. I am the survivor advocate and mental health coach for a nonprofit organization called Generate Hope, where we actually get the privilege to walk alongside survivors of human trafficking and provide a long-term residential safe house for them as well. Um, we get to help them reintegrate back into society. We get to stand along them in their you know, their struggles and their journey. And it's such a beautiful experience to see such amazing women, I mean, really really overcome a lot of their trauma and their experiences that some survivors don't get the opportunity to take. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Kaylin, thank you for being here. Susan, we'll send it over to you next. My name is Susan Johnson, and I'm the co-founder and director of Alabaster Jar Project. Um, similar to Generate Hope, um, we operate up in North County, San Diego. We also offer a long-term housing program to help empower women who've been uh, victimized and exploited um, to help them get back on their feet again in a healing and holistic environment, um, helping encourage them towards self-sufficiency. We also offer a resource center to help individuals in the community that might need just additional resources or a peer support group. Um, we are one of the first um, support groups that were in um, North San Diego County. And um, we, we believe in peer empowerment. So a lot of our resources are directed at the, from peers themselves. Susan, thank you for what you do for our community. You know, there are really not enough shelters and resources and beds, as you heard us say in the documentary. And we have two of uh, some wonderful resources for our survivor community represented here tonight. Thank you, guys. Kay, introduce yourself for us, please. Hi, my name is Kay Thomas. I am the clinical training manager for North County Lifelines Project Life. You may have seen me on the film as Kathleen. I uh, do a, quite a bit of work, and we do quite a bit of work throughout all of San Diego County, but we are neighbors with Susan and the fantastic Alabaster Jar Project. We do a lot of different things. So we are one of two organizations that are actually on call to the San Diego Human Trafficking Task Force 24-7. We also have our own clinical program where we offer intensive case management, trauma therapy, behavioral health therapy, peer support through parenting, as well as peer support for folks with lived experience. And then lastly, we have a transitional housing program where we offer free housing for up to two years in a fully furnished apartment in North County. Okay, you know, is North County Lifeline considered shelter care then? I always thought that they were more of a, a resource kind of yes. facility. So yeah, actually during the pandemic, we had the opportunity to open up a lot of our services and actually uh, have more units than we had previously. So we've been huh. housing for about three years, but it's gotten a lot bigger in the last two. Well, fantastic. See, we're all learning together here tonight. And uh, let's dive right into the questions. The first question on our list, how does one go about securing the documentary for a showing to a group of people? So I'll take that one real quick. Uh, I am happy to get in touch with you personally. I give out my email address. It's monica.dean at nbcuni.com. You can find me on social media as well. Of course, the seven episodes series is available, as I mentioned, on NBC7.com slash stolen. But if you are interested in, see, in screening the version that we saw tonight, it is available for free on NBC's free Peacock app. But if you get in touch with me personally, I am happy to help facilitate as my schedule permits. Um, okay, please email me, social media, you know, direct message me, whatever. I am happy to get in touch uh, on behalf of this mission because this is, as I mentioned, a, a calling for me. This is something that I feel like my, not everyone's going to make a documentary, but that was where I was in this space. Okay, next question. What role can the church play in the prevention of sexual exploitation and how can we help survivors? Okay, Keelan, let's just start with you for the survivor community. How can the church help survivors? Yeah, I think it all really starts with being able to have the conversation. I think we need to do a better job as a church community, you know, getting comfortable being uncomfortable, mm -hmm. really having the conversation to open the gateway of, yes, I mean, it's in the Bible, right? Prostitution is in the Bible, so it should be something that we're normalizing, that we're really engaging and having the conversation in, because that's how we're going to, I, I can almost guarantee in a lot of big churches, there's a survivor somewhere in there yeah. of some type of exploitation. So I think that starting the conversation, having resources available, um, but it really just begins with us being comfortable enough to speak up. Yeah, for sure. Susan, you work in shelter care. What can the church do to support our shelter care communities? 
Well, first, they can check out all the amazing resources through churchesagainsttrafficking.com. Mm -hmm. Um, there are some amazing resources, everything from advocacy to um, collecting donations for the different shelters that are, that are available. One thing that I'm particularly interested in is getting together, who's going to do outreach? Who is going to go and, and reach out to the men and educate the men and the buyers? Who's going to do outreach to the individuals that are exploiting themselves and love on them and let them know there are pathways out? Um, it takes all of us to do that. And I think one of the biggest things, as I watched this documentary and I, I saw the buyer um, not fully understanding and not really admitting, is how can the church hold men accountable? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've actually spoken to uh, faith groups and afterwards have actually had men of faith, pastor, come up and say, I am a reformed sex buyer. Mm -hmm. um, Who's having those tough conversations? Who's holding men accountable within the church community and in the community at large to say, brother, we love you, but this is wrong, and let's help to fix it? Yes. Not you know, in condemnation, but mm -hmm. in correction. And maybe that starts with opening the discussion through something like this, through a screening where we get that conversation going. Kay, I know that you do a lot of outreach and you've had situations like Susan mentioned where people have stood up and self-identified maybe even for the first time as a survivor or as someone who has participated in the exploitation of somebody else. Give us some perspective from your kind of clinical background how many people are impacted by this issue? Because I think most people, when they look around their church congregation, are unaware that there are people sitting in the pews who are impacted. Yeah, you know, I think there, there's a lot of ways that this is happening, and I think first and foremost to think about the reality that so many individuals utilize online pornography bases for their sexual needs and for sexual pleasure. And while I'm not speaking yes or no to the idea of pornography, but recognizing the reality that we don't have healthy conversations around sex. We don't have healthy conversations around our relationships in general. I grew up in the church as well, and so I'm really familiar with some of the messages I received as a female individual growing up, and the messages that the males received around me were very different, and there was always that space, right, of like, oh, make sure, you know, you got to do the praise and worship test where you lift your hand above your head and make sure you can't see your belly button when your <laughs> shirt goes up, right? But there was very much this sense of like, well, you're going to cause someone to stumble. Mm -hmm. Really? Well, that's fascinating. What about my life and what about me, right? And so I think just like Susan was saying, right, we have to shift the conversation to stop being in this space of kind of patriarchal norms, but to start to recognize that like that female is across from you is intelligent and smart and beautiful and kind and has just as much value as you do. In addition to, I think the other piece being that something that I've seen really commonly within the movement is there's so often that an individual who's experienced trafficking won't realize they've experienced that until they're an adult. So many of the folks that you saw on today's film actually didn't know that they were trafficking survivors until they were well into their adulthood. And so this is really important to keep in mind because we don't have conversations about what healthy sex and consent looks like and self-love looks like. And so we continue to perpetuate this space where there are folks out there that are being exploited every day and they probably won't realize it for another 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so we have to shift how we have the conversation to help people identify early. I think talking about the digital space and how many people have easy access to pornography and to explicit material is, it's a tricky conversation to have because especially as a journalist where their right to free speech and free expression, people feel sometimes they are putting out uh, material and being paid, so there's a fair exchange. But I think there's also some crossover in exploitation that I have heard from survivors talk, you know, that we've interviewed talk about. One of the questions here, sites like OnlyFans, which some adults use as a second income for working professionals, this person mentions their nursing coworkers, is there a place for paid explicit material or does it cause too much harm by allowing options for trafficking? Keelan, you wanna start? Absolutely. Um, I think when we come to the place of saying, okay, I need something extra, it becomes survival sex, right? It's not just them doing something in the moment that doesn't have a, a price tag attached to it. What we're also seeing is like, what is the cost, 
right? So the selling of somebody's body compared to the $100 that they received, that doesn't equal out. So what we're seeing also when I'm looking at this and I hear this question, it reminds me a little bit about like gateway drugs, right? We hear alcohol, we hear weed, and then it's next thing you know, you're into something super hardcore. It's no different with exploitation. It starts out maybe them thinking that it's a choice, it's something they want to do, but then they end up finding that they're in very dangerous situations and then they don't know how to get out of it. And we were just talking about this actually in the audience. Kay, you had mentioned that you have, uh, have had personal testimonies from clients who don't get enough money and then end up linking up with someone online who is posing as a manager and essentially ends up exploiting. You want to briefly mention yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've had folks that we've worked with over the last uh, year and a half with the pandemic who have lost their job. They didn't qualify for unemployment for whatever reason. And so they heard, well, if I go and I make an OnlyFans account, I can just make a, you know, account and post a couple feet pics and then I'll get my rent taken care of. And what a lot of folks don't know about OnlyFans is it's actually a subscription-based platform. And so you have to subscribe in order to send a message to the content creator. And what folks will do is they'll subscribe and then they'll kind of hold that subscription amount hostage. If you don't do what I say, I'm going to unsubscribe and you're going to lose my money. And something that we found that has happened is folks are working anywhere from 10 to 14 hour days and on average they're only making about $146 per month. Wow. Per month. So there's this kind of very specific image and idea of what OnlyFans looks like based on media, based on music and kind of how different industries have uh, romanticized what OnlyFans can do for individuals and the reality is is that people then get contacted because they're desperate and someone will say oh give me your bank account give me your Instagram mm -hmm. give me your OnlyFans and I'll be your manager and all you have to do is create the content now mm -hmm. and now this person is experiencing remote trafficking and identity theft at the same time. It's eye-opening, right? I mean, you don't think of things like this until you realize what is happening out there and how the digital space allows for so much exploitation. Susan, this next question, maybe you can start us off here. Partnering with community groups, with schools, to raise awareness, to increase outreach to small groups or collaborators. Uh, this person asks, you know, they, they're saying they'd really appreciate being able to contact officials to support and ensure we spread awareness, especially to parents and in the school space. So what would your advice to them be? I would say plug into, again, the resources on churchesagainsttrafficking.com, as well as look up uh, Ginger Shaw and the Yusef Miller. They are the community um, there is a, um, an advisory board here in San Diego for Human Trafficking Advisory Committee, and there's eight different arms of that. One of those arms is called the Community Committee, and they hold meetings every month, and they actually do um, outreach. I know that they're getting ready to do an outreach um, to make sure that massa massage establishments actually have the, eight, eight, the 800 number flyer. Um, those are amazing groups to plug into, to educate, as well as to share the information. And it doesn't cost anything. It's free to the community, and we need your support. So when you join in and you raise more awareness to in your community, in your neighborhood, in your cul-de-sac, um, you're helping to educate everyone around and raise that awareness. It's really up to what you can plug into. You know, in episode two of the Stolen docu-series, we address the instance of commercial sexual exploitation, reports of that coming from schools. And we found that there were reports that came from every single school district in San Diego County. Now, some were substantiated cases of trafficking, others were just reports of suspected trafficking, so we weren't able to confirm if all of those were, in fact, trafficking cases. But the, this is happening in schools, and it's happening in all different communities. And, you know, to that end, I think that we need to be having discussions with kids as young as 6th, 7th, 8th grade. I am a mom of three kids. I have a 4th grader, a 7th grader, and a 10th grader, and we've talked with all of them kind of age-appropriately about this topic. It's difficult. It's certainly uncomfortable. But we, we need to be having these conversations because, really, they're our first line of defense. I mean, Keelan, wouldn't you agree that they're, they're going to be with their peers and they're going to see these things, and if they're able to spot them, they'll be able to report them. Yeah, 
absolutely. I mean, I know working some with Point Loma Nazarene University, we have a program um, called the No More Program, where we actually get the awesome opportunity to go into high school and middle schools show them what human trafficking is, show the red flags, and then arm them up to be able to fight against that. I mean, I have a 14-year-old daughter, and I mean, I've already been in an instance where she went into the store, I walked around the corner, and somebody tried to pick her up. So what I knew, especially as a survivor, was like to have these difficult conversations, these kids are not naive. When we step into these schools, I mean, even at sixth and seventh grade, they know what's going on. So half the time when we're beginning to have these conversations, they know more than what we think they do. Susan, yes, go ahead. Thank you, Keelan. I want to add to that. I have two daughters myself, and I've also been a, a volunteer within the schools. I've been a Girl Scout leader. And you know, some of the best advocates are actually those children. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I was able to empower not just my girls, but the girls in our Girl Scout troop. And they later on became advocates and peer advocates and went on to college. And I'm, yeah, I'm older than I think, than I probably look. But yes, they're in college now. Uh, but some of these young women, and they were uh, friends with my daughter uh, from their basketball team, they actually did fundraisers. They collected donations um, for our programs, and they rose awareness, and they were themselves the youth. So I think when you have the appropriate conversations and you are actually empowering your youth to then talk to and, and raise awareness, who better? I think if I was empowered with this information when I was an adolescent, I would have made so many different choices to friends that I knew were being exploited, but I didn't know how to, to talk about it or to, to handle it. This dynamic can change with education that comes from home, comes from the parent, comes from a loving individual, um, a volunteer, a Sunday school teacher, a parent next door. Yeah, it can't just be one person. It can't just be mom and dad because sometimes my kids tune out what I have to say, but they'll hear it from somebody else, a trusted adult or an older peer or something. Uh, Kay, I, I wanna uh, start with you on this next one. Um, this person says, I feel like this topic and issue needs to be pressed harder in social media and in other media platforms. How can we make this happen? How are you seeing kind of this conversation be taken into those spaces and what can be done? Yeah, I mean, I think I've definitely seen, and I'm sure that Susan and Keelan have seen as well, um, examples of awareness campaigns like the End It campaign and the Blue Ribbon campaign and things like that over the years through social media. And I think social media can absolutely be a powerful space. And what I would encourage the individual who asked this question is to consider what is the purpose of what you're sharing online? Is it to create a social media campaign so it's got a trendy hashtag and you feel like you raised awareness? Or is it to truly start a conversation? And those approaches look very different sometimes. And so I think being intentional about how we utilize social media, because it's an incredible platform. Um, I mean, there's so many incredible social media platforms and really creative ways that people are doing that. And I think even the example of the uh, safe models that they shared earlier, right, with the hashtag. Like, the models against trafficking. Yes, that's a perfect example of a way to create a campaign that really highlights the dangers of the modeling industry and exploitation, as opposed to saying like, hey, here's somebody in chains. I can tell you in the five years that I've worked in this field, I've only ever met one person who was physically restrained like that, one person. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important that we stop sensationalizing the issue, which sometimes social media can do that, right? And look at it from the reality of, what does this look like when I pass this person in the supermarket? What does this look like when I see this kid riding their bike on my street? What does this look like when I see this teenager posting pictures of herself in her bra and her PJs, right? And how can I step in and do something different? Because these are your children's peers. I mean, I have scanned through TikTok and Instagram and come across pictures, and my daughter and I have had a discussion. What kind of attention do you think this picture is soliciting? What, who is reaching out to this person, do you think? And having that discussion about where does it go from there? Now, what if this picture went a little further and we have some of the discussions about the topics that we saw tonight in the stolen documentary? 
And that's what we need to be doing. I do think we need to be present. In fact, the number one thing I feel that I heard from people who either were survivors or had lived experience or were experts or worked in this space in any way, shape, or form, they said the number one thing that parents can do is be present. And that's just not in the home with the child, but actively engaged in what that child is doing and engaging in online. And I know, especially after a year and a half of distance learning, that is really hard, parents. It is really, really hard because you can't be everywhere at all times. But if we can equip them to know what a red flag looks like, then I think we're off on the right path. I think also creating that space and that relationship with your children to let them know, you know, you can come to me with anything and I may not be happy about it. I may di be disappointed, but I'm always gonna love you. Yeah. And that conversation of love, um, I think of even in my childhood, how many things I hid from my parents out of fear of rejection and abandonment and, and, and their rage when had I had the courage or the in inkling that I would have been embraced and loved, how different that conversations could have been and how different the trajectory of, of the circumstances could have been. Yeah. Love and grace and forgiveness. I mean, isn't that what we are all aspiring to achieve anyway? And being able to do that in our parenting would actually be modeling something really amazing for our children. This, I had to share this because one of the questions we have here, it says, in preparation for this workshop, I spoke with my sixth grade daughter and asked if she was aware of any human trafficking at her school, and she said yes. Sixth grade. I mean, when we think about like the girls in the Posner case who were 15 and 16 years old, think about what a 15 or a 16 year old young woman is dealing with. They're not ready to make decisions like this. I mean, Kay, it always stands out in my mind, the brain not fully developed until you're 25 years old. And, you know, and some people will say, well, but some, some young women or young men are more sexually mature at a younger age. What would you tell them? Well, sexual maturation has to do with your body and not your mind. So that's the first piece I would start with. Um, the other piece I would mention too is that the brain is only fully developed at the age of 25 if you've had a normal upbringing. Mm. If you grew up in poverty, if you grew up with trauma, if you grew up with domestic violence, if you grew up with hunger, if you grew up with a traumatic event of some kind, your brain is probably still not gonna be fully functioning and formed by the age of 25. And many of these uh, individuals that we saw in the movie tonight shared examples of ways that they were experiencing grooming or other forms of abuse or trauma along the way that skewered their ability to really see what was in front of them. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason why we talk about some of these risk factors and indicators because oftentimes those are things that we think like, oh, well, they've got, you know, everything's fine, nothing's wrong, like, you know, they're just, their parents fight a little bit. But what that looks like is exactly what you've said, Monica, right? Parents who aren't present, parents who aren't able to provide that support, parents who aren't able to have difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. We don't grow when we're comfortable. And so we have to have uncomfortable conversations with our kids because that's how we grow. That's how our kids grow as well. And so I think thinking back to the idea of these individuals being sexually mature, yes, their bodies may have matured, but that's not even remotely related to what's happening in their mind, mentally, as well as emotionally. You know, two years ago, before I started this investigation, and it was kind of brewing in my soul and my spirit, you need to do more. You've got this platform as a journalist. There's something more that can be done. There's a larger story that needs to be told. Uh, I held a gathering inside my home, and I invited my neighbors and my friends and anyone who was interested, and I said, this is going to be a difficult happy hour. <laughs> I don't know how happy it's actually going to be, but... You know, we had wine and cheese, and we had a guest speaker, and we talked about sex trafficking. And there were some tears with some parents, and there were some questions that were asked, but it started the conversation. So I love this. What can I do tomorrow to be a part of this work? I mean, consider how you might reach your immediate sphere of influence. Whether you are at work somewhere, maybe you're in healthcare, how many survivors go seek health care. It's incredible. I mean, Keelan, do you know, like, it, it, as a survivor, at some point, you will probably need medical attention. And if we had more awareness of what to look for, we might be able to help somebody. 
Yes, absolutely. And I think like that's a, a very valid question, right? What can I do? And people want to do something. They don't want to be stagnant. They don't. So, you know, the first thing that I always look at is always give of your time, talent, or treasure. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't always have the finances to be able to give back, but then that's okay. Go ahead and give of your talent. What are you good at? I know at Generate Hope we have volunteers of all kinds. And if it's time, like looking at investing to what that looked like to help organizations and partner with them as well. Now you can't just show up on the doorstep of Generate Hope and say, I'm here to volunteer, what can I do? And another one of the questions was, how can I volunteer at the organizations represented here on this panel? So if someone wanted to volunteer, for Generate Hope, and we'll get to Alabaster and North County Lifeline too, what would your advice to them be? Go to the website? Yes, so you would go to the website, generatehope.org, mm -hmm. and what you would do is go to the volunteer page. We have a volunteer orientation, and we actually do a next step where we do a HT 101 and 102 training with all of the volunteers as well, and we'll go ahead and plug them in the area, any area that they'd like to volunteer. Susan, how about you? Same thing, but go to alabasterjarproject.org <laughs> and click on join us and the drop down will go to a volunteer inquiry and it will lead you through a volunteer application and process. And for individuals that do want to work directly in our programming, we do require 40 hours of, of training um, because it is very sensitive uh, work that we're doing. We do have community serve days, um, usually quarterly, and they're with different community groups. So that would be another way if your church wanted to do a serve day um, where they get together and do a special project, we do welcome those as well. Okay, how about you guys? So similar. If you go to nclifeline.org and click on volunteer, you can apply for an application online with our volunteer program. We also provide similar extensive training for our volunteers to make sure that the skills and the, the tools and the talents that they're bringing to the table match what our survivors are looking for and needing in their life. But in addition to like, yes, absolutely, please volunteer with these incredible orgs. And I also wanna remind folks that you don't just have to get involved with trafficking on the intervention side after the problems already occurred, mm -hmm. right? You have to start with prevention. And so maybe your skill is having conversations with nine-year-olds about healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. Maybe your skill is creating a men's group to hold folks accountable. Mm -hmm. Maybe your skill is going out and doing outreach. Just a reminder, Christ didn't have friends who were religious leaders. Christ was friends with the tax collectors, with the prostitutes, with the people that no one wanted to spend time with. And so when we spend our time in spaces that insulate us from the problem, so we have to see documentaries like this to know what's really happening in San Diego, we're contributing to the problem. So how can you get out into the streets and solve homelessness? Survival sex, as Keelan mentioned earlier, is one of the biggest ways that people end up experiencing trafficking, and homelessness is one of the biggest basic needs that many of our survivors have. So get out there to a soup kitchen. Get out there in a prevention program. Get out in your church and start having difficult conversations, because this problem isn't going to go away if people keep volunteering on the back end for folks who have already experienced the problem. If we continue to rely on people like Keelan, like Jessica, like Kyler, like Marjorie, like Kathy, who have experienced trafficking to move the movement forward, it's never gonna end. This is one of the oldest crimes in the book, and it's not gonna end until we do something differently about it. And if there's nothing else you can do, and these women are very humble, you can give of your money. Oh, yes. We'll, we'll take need your money. Financial we'll take your money. support. We'll take, yes. we'll take it. Um, yes. Yeah. They will yeah. take it. Yeah. They need services. It is very expensive to shelter people. It is very expensive to run some of these programs. And so, you know, someone asked, what is being done in schools? The No More program is fantastic. Uh, each school district kind of has a different protocol, but I'll tell you what, one of the most gratifying moments in the past year was when my daughter got to go to school in person and came home and said, Mom, one of my friends came up to me and they said they watched episode one of Stolen in Class. And that nearly brought me to tears because that is exactly why I tried to be obedient to this call that was so 
on my heart for so long because I wanted to have a tool that would open the door to these tough conversations. And the fact that we're sitting here in church and we're talking about some of these tough conversations is really, I think, a victory for our church community because it's easy for people to look the other way and it's because it's icky. The topic is uncomfortable and we don't want to believe that this could be our sons and daughters. But I think once we start talking about it and once we start confronting this issue, I mean, I lost a lot of sleep and cried a lot of tears over this entire project, but it pales in comparison to the people who have lived this life of exploitation. And if we can prevent one child from suffering that type of exploitation and sex trafficking, it is worth every sleepless night you will have. I promise you will not, you will not regret it and God will order your steps. Okay, I got to get back to my, my list here. We've got a lot of really great questions. Um, the schools, we got through that. Let's see. Oh, the updates on any of the people who were victims of sex trafficking in the documentary. I am so proud of so many of our survivor advocates and survivor leaders, and many of them like to be referred to as lived experience experts because they really moved past their uh, title as a survivor and are sharing their experience for the benefit of others. And they are experts in this space, and they are sharing their hearts. So many of them are doing that. Some of the updates are in the written articles that accompany the episodes online. Uh, the father, sadly, is still struggling to get his daughter into a safe place to get uh, the help that she needs um, or the help that he, he feels that she needs. So often, and I want to ask you ladies about this too, the case that we had with the father who was looking for his daughter, he believed that she was in the clutches of a sex trafficker who was then arrested and charged with those crimes. And she constantly believed that he was her boyfriend, that it's this bad, you know, it's, a, it's like a bad relationship in many cases. And I, I remember reading a statistic that said it takes on average like seven times for a survivor to completely exit the life. Keelan, can you shed some light on that for us? Yes, absolutely, because what we'll see is trauma bonds. And just thinking about like some of the survivors we currently work with um, and who are in our care, I mean, some of them have been out for six months and they still miss their traffickers. Yeah. Like they still long for the relationship. They still romanticize the good times that they had while trying not to look at all the bad times. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's very heartbreaking, but I think it goes to show just how much goes into manipulation, how much time goes in to really coercion and being able able to get these victims in a place that they've been physically, sexually abused, tortured, and they still love their traffickers or that facade that's attached to it. And Susan, I want to ask you this one. How has the fight against human trafficking progressed in recent years? Are you seeing progress being made? Um, yes and no. Um, just the fact that we're here, I mean, I actually, with uh, Ginger Shaw and, and a few others, Jamie Gates, uh, we had the idea to start Churches Against Trafficking. Uh, before I even started Alabaster Jar Project, I, I left it in the capable hands of uh, Point Loma Nazarene, and to see it grow to this to this state is amazing. That is progress. To see that there are more shelters, that there's actually more beds that, that have opened up is wonderful, but there still needs to be more. To see the exploitation that has quadrupled um, during and, and through this COVID um, pandemic and the digital, that is heartbreaking. Um, it, it feels like two steps forward and 10 steps back. And someone's chiming in with this specifically for you right now, Susan. Have you had any success on making an institution commit to helping? <laughs> what? Huh? <laughs> So many questions. That that, that, that is I, that might like, take. Is it, is like, it hard to find organizations or even churches to really make a substantial commitment to investing in this cause? You know that that's that's a double-edged sword because um, I I want to truthfully answer it that there's really only one church that financially contributes to us on a monthly recurring basis, mm -hmm. uh, but that amount is not enough to pay our rent mm -hmm. or our mortgage. 
Um, we get invited to churches to speak, and sometimes they take up collections and donations, and that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, we, we love that, and we, we are grateful for that. Um, there are church groups that come and do service projects, and we have a lot of volunteers. Uh, but financially, it's, it's really hard to, um, to raise the capital that it takes to keep the wheels on the bus, to keep the lights on. Um, you know, we've been paying rent. We're finally in a place now where we've raised enough money and gotten a mortgage lender to actually approve a loan for us so we can Yay. purchase Congratulations. a home. Thank you. Uh, but that's been eight years in the making. And how many beds are in that home? It'll be five beds. Five beds. And it's estimated um, upwards of 8,000 trafficking victims in San Diego County a year. Eight beds. So you see the overwhelming need. I love this comment. I just want to share this because I think this is so encouraging. Speaking to being on the preventative side, I think it's so important for people to mentor and disciple kids as they grow, helping in their church class or school classrooms or sports teams, and being that one constant person reminding them of their value goes a long way. Yeah. Right? And Kay, what would you say as a clinician yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. I think, you know, when we think about self-esteem and we think about just kind of even moving the trafficking and trauma piece aside, we see that folks start to experience issues with self-esteem at really young ages, four or five years old. And there's a lot of reasons why that happens, but I think it's a constant reminder for us that when we think about the individuals in our lives and even thinking about, you know, spaces of community and, and coming together in community with Christ, the reality is, is that we can't forget that there's not one member of that community that's any better or worse than another, right? We're all, if we're all equals in the eyes of Christ, we also need to bring that four-year-old in and give that four-year-old the same compassion that we give that 40-year-old who's going out on that missions trip. When we start to shift our perspective to how we can care for our community, like San Diego, like our neighborhoods, like the street that we live on, it shifts what we do with resources. And you know, without speaking too much about kind of larger systemic issues, recognizing the ways that, for example, the money that maybe you spent to go on that missions trip, what could that money have done for a local trafficking organization? You went to China to work on anti-trafficking, but it was happening right here these buildings that have been sitting empty for a year and a half because of the pandemic, whether it's a church, a school, an office building, right? That money that's going into the real estate of San Diego, and it is expensive to live in San Diego, right? So, you know, those of us who have safe homes and housing programs, we're struggling to pay the rent in the same way that you're struggling to pay the rent so that our survivors don't have to, so that our survivors have a safe place to stay so they can take care of their trauma. And so I think, thinking about it in that way, right? Shifting the conversation to how am I caring for my entire community? Not just the person sitting across the table from me or the person who sleeps next to me in my bed, but how do I care for every person I come in contact with in the way that Christ would? I, I think that. I, if yeah. I can add, um, I was thinking about this dynamic through the docu-series of how the, the, the buyer and the um, the victim, the survivor, right? They were both looking for economic advantage and they were targeting the, the individual who had the economic advantage. What if we flipped that on its head and said, you know what, those that have the economic advantage, what if instead of buying sex, you offer a legitimate job or scholarship or fund a program? You know, what, what would happen in that type of world? What if these individuals that were exploited online through the OnlyFans, what if instead of looking at that as an only resource, there were actually other legitimate job opportunities that were created to help employ them? Mm -hmm. Wonderful sentiments and wonderful inspiration. I think that we can all take some inspiration. It can feel really overwhelming, and producing this documentary was a really overwhelming task. And sometimes when you look at something and feel overwhelmed, the reaction is to walk away or look away. But just being here tonight, please be encouraged. There is hope. You are part of the puzzle of, this, of the solution to this problem. And it, just those small things, loving on kids, being present, hosting an awareness event. All of those things start a conversation that lead to wonderful, thought-provoking discussions that can get us in the right direction. And so 
I want to introduce Kim Barry Jones, who is the director of Point Loma Nazarene Center for Justice and Reconciliation. She has some wonderful thoughts in this space. She's making great strides in trying to reach our community and beyond, really setting a path um, to success for a lot of people. And I wanna thank you and your organization too, the university, for hosting this tonight. And thank you to Journey Community Church for doing this. This is something that I think we can replicate in churches across the globe. I mean, especially virtually, you know? Talk to your friends, talk to your family members, talk to your churches, and God bless you. Thank you so much, Monica, for being with us tonight, for hosting this panel. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. We're so grateful for your time tonight, but also your commitment to this work. This is not easy work, and we know that you put your whole hearts into it. So I am just um, so proud sitting there, just getting knowing that I get to partner with you in this beautiful difficult but beautiful work. So thank you for being here. And thank you for joining us tonight for this screening of Stolen. It's been something that we've been planning for quite a while. And we're so happy to have all of you here. And just a couple of things in closing. We are paying our panelists. We always like to do that. And so if you're interested in supporting the cost of uh, the panelists tonight, you can look on the either the QR code or the link that you see on the screen and make a donation. It would go just directly to supporting our panelists this evening. And we'd love to invite you to continue the conversation with us at our next Churches Against Trafficking meeting. It will be held on Zoom, and it's on November 4th. You can find more information at churchesagainsttrafficking.com. But we'll be diving into looking at how do we prevent vulnerabilities in youth that lead to the recruitment that we're seeing across our county. So we're going to hear from Caitlin Wilson, who is also from North County Lifeline. She is a housing coordinator and therapist. And from Missy Bell, the Church and Community Engagement Associate with Olive Crest Safe Families for Children program. So head to churchesagainsttrafficking.com for the link to that, sign up for that, and we'll send you more information as that comes closer. And then finally, on Friday, October 15th, we have an incredible opportunity for everyone. Everyone is invited to the Human Trafficking Research Conference. Now, you may think that a research conference isn't up your alley, but I'll tell you that there really is something for everyone. We are bringing people in from across the nation who are doing research around best practices and what's working uh, to help, to help uh, fight this fight against human trafficking, but also what's happening around prevention and restoration. So it is free for anybody in San Diego, thanks to a generous grant from our district attorney's office. You can come for free. If you're outside of San Diego, it's only $25. It's at htradar.com. We really encourage all of you to sign up. It's virtual on Friday, October 15th, and then you'll have access to all of the, all of the presentations from that day for a month after if you sign up. So with that, we will be closing out tonight. Again, thank you so much for taking the time to to be here with us tonight for your investment in this work. And we hope that it has encouraged you to uh, take a next step and get involved. Thank you again. <laughs>